thank you so much for having me. Um, it's true, I'm a veteran of PhilSoc. I was thinking the last time that I gave a real talk at PhilSoc was pre-pandemic, so uh, that feels like another lifetime, but I'm really glad. Um, uh, thanks to everyone for coming out. Um, so I want to start out with a passage from the novel 1984, or really it's from an appendix to the novel where Orwell is talking about newspeak, which is uh, the, the language that the totalitarian regime he's imagining has designed. And here's what he says about newspeak in this appendix. There's also a, a, a part in the novel where a character who's involved in the designing of newspeak says some similar things. But I think this is sort of Orwell speaking in his own voice. Uh, the purpose of Newspeak was not only to provide a medium of expression for the worldview and mental habits proper to the devotees of Ingsoc, that is the, um, the totalitarian party, but to make all other modes of thought impossible. It was intended that when Newspeak had been adopted once and for all, and old speak forgotten, a heretical thought that is, a thought diverging from the principles of Ingsoc should be literally unthinkable, at least so far as thought is dependent on words. Its vocabulary was so constructed as to give exact and often very subtle expression to every meaning that a party member could properly wish to express while excluding all other meanings. Okay, so I want to use this passage for a couple of purposes. I want to draw a couple of things out of this. One of them we'll get to as we come along, but I want to start by, by pointing out what Orwell is suggesting here, which is that a native speaker of this language, a monolingual speaker of this language, would be literally unable to entertain certain thoughts. So if this is your language, there are some things you can think and other things that you just can't think. He hedges a little bit, this, uh, at least so far as thought is dependent on words. I'm gonna set that aside. It'll be relevant to some things I wanna say later, so, so we maybe can talk about that at the end. Okay, so what Orwell's postulating here is that by designing a certain language, the government could put a kind of constraint on what people could think. And I think this is an interesting idea, and in fact it's an idea that has a long history in philosophy. So here are some other examples. One from Hilary Putnam. So Putnam's talking about skepticism, the idea that, as he puts it, you might be a brain in a vat. This is like supposed to be like the matrix or something where you don't have any contact with the outside world, you're just the brain in the vat, and computers are feeding you in information as though you're in the outside world, but actually you're not. Uh, so like the Matrix, or like Descartes' evil genius, something like that. So Putnam says, the brains in a bat are not thinking about real trees when they think, quote, there is a tree in front of me, because there's nothing by virtue of which their thought, quote, tree represents real trees. So his big idea here is this. How does your mind get to latch on to things in the outside world? Just having an image that looks like a tree isn't enough, Putnam thinks. Because there could be lots of things in the universe that look like that. A tree is a particular type of biological organism, Putnam thinks, and the only way that you can latch on to that type of organism to come to be able to think about it is by causally interacting with it. So aliens in a distant galaxy that have no trees, no, no, act, no causal access to trees, they just can't think about trees, Putnam thinks. They might, have a, they might think about something that looks just like a tree. They might sort of think of a tree descriptively, like the kind of organism that does such and such. But to actually refer, to actually sort of directly think about trees, you just can't do it unless you're there with them, you've seen them or touched them or, or interacted with them somehow. 
And so likewise, Putnam thinks the brains and fats, who haven't causally interacted with the outside world at all, at least not in the right kind of way, they can't think about trees. Maybe they can think about computer image of a tree or something like that. Maybe that's what their word tree, their concept tree means. But it doesn't mean tree. It can't, but it thinks. Okay. So again, this is a kind of constraint on what certain thinkers can think. Brains and bats just can't entertain certain thoughts. And likewise, I guess, we can't. We can't say what the thoughts we can't entertain are, because that would require you know, entertaining them. But if there's some kind of organism in a distant galaxy that we never causally interacted with, we can't think about that, Putnam would say, in just the way the brains and bats can't think about trees. <coughs> Okay, going back a little bit further, here's David Hume. We cannot form to ourselves a just idea of the taste of a pineapple without having actually tasted it. Um, maybe this is a good place to mention, uh, I'm going to talk briefly about Hume, also about Mill. Um, these are people who had a lot of problematic attitudes about race and colonialism and things. I don't think those attitudes are especially relevant to the things I want to talk about, but I know uh, a lot of you are probably concerned uh, with this kind of aspect of their thinking, and, and I'd like to hear from you uh, if you think it is relevant. Um, so we can talk about that later, too, if you'd like. Um, this aspect of Hume, Hume's thinking, Ideas are copies of impressions. That is to say, everything you can think about has to trace ultimately to some experience. And so there is this kind of way of thinking of the taste of pineapple that someone who has never tasted it can't have. You just can't explain it in other words. It's a kind of basic idea you can only get by having the experience and sort of copying. That's Hume's basic thought about how the mind works. So just like you can't, according to Hume, get the idea of colors if you can't see them, you can't get the idea of particular taste if you can't or if you haven't tasted them. And again, this is a kind of constraint. It's saying, if you were a thinker in a certain kind of situation, there are certain kinds of thoughts, thoughts about the taste of pineapple that you're not going to be able to entertain. So let me say a little bit more about the idea of a constraint here. Sometimes when people talk in philosophy of mind, they think of, about mental states and mental events as a kind of relation to a content. So the relation might be belief, or it might be desire, or it might be something else. And the content might be that grass is green, or that I'm eating ice cream, or whatever. So you can believe that grass is green, you can hope that grass is green. Those are very different relations to the same content. Maybe there are some kinds of relations, some kinds of attitudes that, one can, that some thinkers can bear to contents and others can't. But that's not what Putnam and Orwell and Hume are thinking. They're thinking there are some contents, some propositions, perhaps, that some thinkers can bear relations to and others can't. So Putnam, for example, isn't just thinking that you can't be believe a certain thing about trees if you haven't causally interacted with them. If you're a brain in a bat, you can't wonder whether trees are tall. You can't doubt that trees are green. You can't uh, wish that trees were bigger. You can't do any of those things because any, all of those things are relations to contents that are about trees. And you just can't get in touch with any of those contents. So there are constraints on content. There might be a 
lot of different kinds of constraints on content. So one kind of constraint, um, there are some contents that are just too complicated for thinkers like us to entertain. Um, they're, in principle, maybe a godlike being could entertain a thought that uh, captures the exact position of all the grains of sand on the West Sands. But I can't, it's just too long, too complicated, I, I'm not smart enough, and I don't have enough memory. So that's a kind of constraint, that's a content that I can't really get in touch with. But these constraints don't seem like that. They're all, may, maybe Orwell's is a little, maybe, maybe we can talk about exactly what kind of constraint that is. But certainly, at least in the case of Putnam and Hume, they're constraints in thinking about a particular kind of thing. So the taste of pineapple, or a tree. One way of talking about this might be in terms of concept possession. Uh, so we who can think about trees possess the concept of a tree. Brains and bats, according to Putnam, don't. We who tasted pineapple possess the concept of the taste of pineapple. Others who haven't don't, and so on. OK, so, so that's the kind of basic idea of a content constraint here. Now, I want to point out a couple of things about this idea as I'm thinking about it. Content constraints can come in different strengths, and they can come in different strengths in multiple ways. So some content constraints are going to be very wide in application. Putnam is thinking, I'm going to tell you something about the metaphysics of representation. Every, representa every possible representation is going to have to work in something like this way. It's going to depend on something like this kind of causal relation. So it's not just us. It's not just like, this is how our minds work and get in touch with stuff. Aliens would have to work the same way. Any possible creature you can imagine would have to work the same way. At least Maybe I'm reading something into Putnam, but I, I think this is a plausible reading of the kind of thing he has in mind. Orwell, on the other hand, might not be thinking like this. After all, I guess it's possible that there be a kind of being that's born with an innate concept of democracy or something like that. Maybe not every thinker depends on language in the way Orwell is thinking we do. Anyway, he certainly hasn't made the case uh, that every possible thinker does depend on language in this way. So a more plausible reading of Orwell is narrower than this reading of Putnam that I'm suggesting. He's saying, for thinkers like us, for, for humans, or anyone with a mind that works kind of basically like ours work, there's this kind of constraint. So I call that scope. Some constraints purport to apply very universally, necessarily, others don't. Constraints also come in different strengths. Again, I think Putnam would say, if you're a brain in a bat, you just can't think about things. It is impossible. But it, it's not so clear to me that any claim that strong would be plausible for Orwell. Maybe there is some great genius born in the Newspeak community who comes up with the idea of democracy, even though there was no antecedent word for it. That's got to be possible, even if it's very rare, very difficult. So some constraints, like Putnam's, are going to be of the form, this is completely impossible for anybody. Others, like perhaps Orwell's, are going to be more of the form, this makes entertaining this content difficult. Perhaps not completely impossible, but difficult. Okay. I'm still thinking of the, the weaker kind of thing as a constraint, although it is not, and it's a constraint that perhaps under some circumstances could be overcome. 
Okay, so that's the notion of a constraint. Now, I think this is already a philosophically interesting and kind of under-discussed, under-explored notion, but I'm gonna, uh, I I'm gonna turn now to some further reasons why you might be interested in it. In particular, I wanna think about how Orwell's scenario, the kind of, um, the kind of scenario about newspeak that we started out with, what that's going to tell us about freedom of speech. <coughs> now, of course, in the story, the Ingsoc regime is very oppressive. They go to great lengths to try and get people to say and even think the right things. That's kind of what the novel is about in some sense. But think about that, that, that that's in part because Newspeak has not been universally adopted. This is one of the tools that they want to use to get people to think the right things, but they're not there yet. But think about what Orwell says in that passage that we began. If Newspeak were universally adopted and old speak forgotten, a heretical thought would be unthinkable. You couldn't even entertain it. Now, let's imagine that scenario. Again, this is, this is going into the future from where the novel is. But suppose that happened. At that point, the government would need to take steps to restrict what people say. Because nobody could say anything bad, and nobody could say anything the government would, wouldn't like, right? So the government could say, say what you like. Think what you like. You are completely unrestricted, unregulated in what you're allowed to say, what you're allowed to think. No rules. Now, would thinkers, the, the, the citizens of this regime, have freedom of speech? Well, no rules, right? But on the other hand, they couldn't really say anything all that interesting. Uh, or, you know, anyway, there's a lot of interesting things that they really couldn't say. So I want to say that there is a sense in which, in this scenario, the citizens still wouldn't have genuinely free speech. Even though there would be no rules, no restrictions on what they could say other than those imposed by their conceptual and linguistic resources, what they have is not something that we should think of as sort of true, genuine free speech. Now, I think there are No, I, I think everyone should share my judgment about the case that there's something wrong in this scenario as regards free speech. And I just want to mention a couple of issues here about how we think about this, partially, uh, mostly just to set them aside. So I said we should say in this kind of case they don't have free speech. But somebody might think that's not the right way to describe it. Really, they are free. They do have free speech. But it's just that in addition to being free, there's something else that most of us want, and that is adequate conceptual and linguistic resources. So there are kind of two things here. There's freedom of speech, and that's a good thing. But really, it's only, it's only really good in the presence of adequate resources. Um, <coughs> I, I have no objection to this way of talking, but I'm not going to talk that way. I'm, I'm going to think that in this Orwell scenario, there is no free speech. Um, uh, I think it's basically just a kind of uh, terminological dispute at this point. Okay, second key question here. 
I think that when we start thinking about freedom of speech, and we think about the right to freedom of speech, that makes it seem like free speech is a kind of yes or no, black and white, on or off kind of thing, right? Like, either you have it or you don't. But once you start thinking along the lines of these Orwell scenarios, you might think that that isn't quite right. It might be that you can have it in some respects, but not in others. And it might even be that you can have it to a lesser or greater extent. And I think once you, once you have that thought, it's very natural to think of this, this kind of freedom as a gradable matter, that is to say something you can have more or less of. I'm interested to think more about how that way of thinking about this kind of freedom bears on questions about uh, what kind of rights we have to it, because rights, again, seem like a very black and white kind of thing. Um, but I'm not going to go into detail about that now. I'd be curious to hear um, if anyone has any reflections on that later. So those are two interesting issues that are already raised by this scenario. But I want to set them aside. So I'm, go I'm going to say, in the Orwell kind of scenario, they don't have free speech. And I want to say that we're considering a kind of black and white notion of free speech. So, so, so like either you have it or you don't kind of notion of free speech. With that notion in mind, I want to say what the Orwell scenario tells us is something like this. Freedom of speech requires adequate conceptual and communicative resources. If you don't have good enough conceptual resources, then you can't really say anything anyway. We don't count that as free speech. That's the driving thought here. And I call this the adequate resources requirement on free speech. Now, this way of saying it uh, alludes to the notion of adequacy, but what counts as adequate? Well, I think there are a lot of interesting questions here. I think uh, <coughs> we shouldn't think of ourselves as unfree merely because we think Putnam's right and we think probably there are kinds of creatures or kinds of thing in distant galaxies that we haven't closely interacted with and so can't think about. That may be true. There are things in this universe we can't think about. That's not in, in itself enough, I think, to impinge on our freedom. So we shouldn't say our conceptual resources are inadequate just because there are things in distant galaxies we can't think about. Likewise, we might think Hume is right, and there are things we haven't tasted. So, you know, maybe you never tried Marmite, or peanut butter, or pineapple, who knows? Does that mean your conceptual linguistic resources are inadequate in a way that undermines your freedom of speech? Well, I wouldn't have thought so. Okay, so why not, like, like, what, what, why are those gaps not so bad as regards free speech, whereas the Orwell kind of gap, like where if you can't talk about freedom or democracy or romantic love or all the things that that government doesn't like, that seems really bad as regards free speech. Why? What's the difference? Well, I think this is a good question, and, and I, I wish I had a better answer. But, Here's a kind of first shot, which is in itself in need of further clarification and development. I call it the needs account of adequacy. Um, once conceptual and communicative resources are adequate, just in case they're sufficient to put one in a position to meet one's basic needs. Uh, where basic needs is construed fairly broadly to include not just the things you need to survive, like food, but also things that uh, you need, uh, like a need to 
be able to participate in civil society, to enter into meaningful relations with others, to understand your own experiences, and so on, things like that. Okay. Uh, what kind of things count as needs? Well, again, this is, this is where I wish I had something more detailed to say. Um, maybe it's something we can talk about later. Okay, but I hope we have at least enough in place here <coughs> To, 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 to see the following kind of thought. There's more to freedom of speech than the absence of external restriction. You have to have, you have to be able to say things, to have a kind of free speech worth wanting, as, as James and I might put it. So that's the basic thought, and what I want to do then, in the last bit of this talk, is to think through some consequences of that thought. So here's the basic idea. Other things equal, it's good for free speech if we have more conceptual resources or better conceptual resources. Better is probably a, a better way to put it than more, actually. And bad for free speech if we have less or worse conceptual resources. So more conceptual resources is apt to make us freer, apt to get us over that adequacy threshold. Things that take our conceptual resources away make us less free in this respect, uh, perhaps threaten to bring us under this adequacy threshold. That's the thought. So here's a consequence which um, might already seem a little bit surprising. I mean, I think from one point of view, it's not surprising, but, but it may be surprising to have gotten here from the point of view of free speech. And that is, it's a good thing to promote institutions that provide greater conceptual resources. So for example, schools. Now you might not have thought that schools like in themselves were that relevant to free speech, but I think you know, one reason maybe we have a right to education is because we have a right to free speech, and you don't get free speech unless you have adequate conceptual resources. And you don't get adequate conceptual resources without some kind of education. Okay, so I hope you can see that, that pushing in this direction on free speech is already getting us somewhere kind of substantial and interesting, maybe, maybe surprising to get there from that point of view. But maybe it wasn't that controversial that we should be supporting schools and things. Anyway, I hope, I hope we all wanted to do that. Wait, well, you're here? Okay. Um, now I want to make a move that I think maybe a little bit more controversial. And I want to start by thinking through this argument from, uh, which I derived originally from John Stuart Mill, uh, but one uh, very influential formulation of it, or statement of it, is from um, the 20th century American Supreme Court Justice, Oliver Wendell Holmes. And uh, so Holmes puts the point in terms of the marketplace of ideas. So here's a quote, he says, the ultimate good desired, uh, which, which in his view is believing or knowing the truth, is better reached by free trade and ideas. But the best test of truth is the power of the thought to get itself accepted in the competition of the market. So Holmes is saying here, the government shouldn't restrict speech even if the government is really sure that, like, this is the truth, those people are wrong, you shouldn't get them to stop saying what they're saying, because it's better, in the interest of promoting the truth, to let people fight it out, and then everyone will see the good arguments on the favor of the truth, and the bad arguments in favor of the falsehood, and they'll all say, oh yeah, the truth, yes. And they'll believe it sort of much more deeply, and sincere but really appreciate it in a way they wouldn't if we just told the bad, the wrong people to go away and shut up. The way 
Mill presents this argument as a kind of dilemma, he says, or tri trilemma, I guess he says, um, if there's some claim that you really believe is true, let it be debated because uh, you'll, you'll get the best arguments in favor of it that way and, and get a firmer grasp on its truth if it turns out to be true. If it turns out to be false, you get the arguments against it, and you'll come to appreciate its falsehood, and that's good for you too. And if it turns out to be kind of a little bit true and kind of a little bit false, you'll be able to see which bits of it are true and which bits of it are false, and that's good for you too. So that, that's Mill's version of the argument. Same kind of project. Now, one thought you might be having with the idea of a content constraint in mind and things like this Orwell scenario in mind is, well, doesn't the idea of a marketplace of ideas a bit uh, depend on what's for sale in the marketplace? Like, if the marketplace doesn't have anything good on the shelves, then buying things in the marketplace isn't, isn't really going to do very well for us. So in the Orwell scenario, let the, let the um, speakers of Newspeak trade in the marketplace as they like, and they're still not going to get anything very worthwhile from doing that. So I, I basically think there's something deeply right about that thought. And this marketplace metaphor, is all, it, the, there's a big limitation on, on what that's really going to deliver. But I think nailing down exactly where the argument goes wrong is a little bit more difficult. So I, I want to say just a little bit about that, and then I'll conclude. So here is my sort of uh, slightly more regimented version of the Holmes Mill argument here. They're saying, we want to believe truths, but the best way to tell whether a claim is true is by letting people debate it. And therefore, we shouldn't restrict debate. Now, some people in philosophy argue about whether it's really true in general that we want to believe truths. So some people want to dispute uh, whether truth is the ultimate good desired. Um, I'll give them that. And I think there's a way of understanding the claim that the best way to tell whether a claim is true is by letting people debate it might be true, at least in a wide range of that is to say, if there is some particular claim that we've already formulated, so we can formulate it, we can formulate its negation, and we're sort of wondering, right, which of those is it? Then it might be that letting people have at it, letting people debate it, is a good way to go. But when we say we want to believe truths, it's not as though we already just have a list and those are the ones we want to believe. We also want to be able to extend our conceptual repertoire to come to entertain claims that we've never enter entertained before and believe those too. I think that is where this Mill Holmes idea doesn't obviously work. So we want to believe truth. Suppose we want to believe the truths about the taste of pineapple we've never tasted it. Well, free and open debate is just never going to get us there, at least not if humans, right? What we've got to do is go out and taste pineapple. And that might be true of a lot of other things, too. So there might be different kinds of things we need to do to get into position to entertain different concepts. And it might be that free and open debate, in the sense they're envisioning, isn't always the best way to do that. And in particular, and what's sort of particularly interesting, I think, or particularly sinister, perhaps, is that we could be in a situation where allowing some people to speak under some circumstances actually decreases our conceptual repertoire, actually implements constraints. So this is the scenario that I, that I want to entertain now. A number of thinkers have thought that experts, 
especially scientific experts, but perhaps also experts in other domains, play a special role in determining the meanings of our words and determining which concepts we possess. So Putnam himself was one of the people who thought this. And Putnam's kind of scenario was, he said, well, I can think about the difference between aluminum and molybdenum. But I, Putnam, am no chemist, no uh, metals expert. I really have no idea what the difference between them is, but I know they are two different metals, and I can think about each of them. I have those concepts. He also said, I don't know the difference between elm trees and beech trees. I can't tell them apart. I just know they're both trees. I know they're different kinds of trees. That's it, OK? But Putnam said, in my mouth, elm, the word means elm. It refers to a certain kind of tree. Beech means beech. It refers to a different kind of tree. How is that possible? Given that I don't know the difference, well, Putnam said, it must be that somebody knows the difference. It's the botanists, or the, the chemists, the metallurgists, of, I don't know who, who knows the difference between different kinds of metals, but it's the botanists, the tree experts. They can tell the difference, and I'm parasitic on them. So it's in virtue of what the experts do that my word means what it does, that my thought is about what it's about. Now, there are different ways of thinking about what's going on here. But I want to claim that on almost any version of this kind of view, experts are going to be in a position to, and in virtue of their activities, experts are sometimes going to create content constraints. So think about Putnam and the beaches and the elms again. In virtue of what the experts do, Putnam is thinking about trees in terms of one categorization, one way of carving these things up. In terms of uh, beaches and elms species, are they of higher category or not? I don't know. It doesn't matter. That, it, that's, that's, that's the way that Putnam is thinking about them. And it's very hard for him to categorize these trees in another way. Sure, he could go learn about different kinds of trees. He could learn to recognize them. He could cook up his own categorization of different kinds of trees in terms of some other feature. But that is a really big job. And most people are just not going to be in a position to do that, especially because it's going to involve breaking away from the influence of the experts who are talking a certain way. And there's typically going to be a big social pressure to avoid doing that. So if the experts, people who are in a certain kind of position, are talking a certain way, that's going to create constraints on how other people can talk and on what kind of thoughts they can enter entertain. Now admittedly, these are not going to be the super strong kind of constraints like what Putnam was talking about when he was talking about brains and bats. So remember in the beginning, I introduced this kind of distinction between different ways constraints could be strong. And I said, Putnam's going to say, this is just a necessary truth. No thinker can entertain the, this thought ever, ever, ever without constantly interacting with it. Whereas someone like Orwell might not want to say that. So these are more on the Orwell side. Maybe they're even weaker than what Orwell had. Nonetheless, I think it's fair to think of them as constraints. But now, if the experts are in a position to constrain what others think, then it really matters, from the point of view of freedom of speech, who is in a position to be treated as an expert. So, for example, if I think that someone's views, were they taken as the views of experts, would make our conceptual repertoire worse, I have a motivation from the point of view of freedom of speech 
to prevent that person from getting in a situation where they're going to be treated as an expert. So it might be that status, we think that here's something that accords status as an expert, uh, giving a talk at a university. So if we let someone with views that we think are going to threaten our conceptual repertoire give a talk at a university, that actually, allowing that, actually has the potential to threaten everyone's free speech by undermining our conceptual repertoire. Or maybe we think actually universities don't matter that much anymore, maybe now it's like having a lot of followers on Twitter. That's what makes you an expert. Well, maybe. In that case, we have a motivation to, to, to not let those people whose views that we, we think might threaten our conceptual repertoire have a lot of followers on Twitter. So I think this way of thinking about free speech, in combination with certain views about the roles of experts, might motivate uh, certain kinds of deplatforming, certain kinds of something you might call cancel culture, What's important here is that regulation is not in itself anti-free speech. That might seem so like regulating some people's speech might actually increase the overall amount of free speech that there is, the overall amount of freedom that's available to everybody. Now that might seem a kind of surprising conclusion, but actually I think it is a, it's, a, it's an instance of a familiar kind of phenomenon. <coughs> Just think, um, it's reasonable to prevent one person from owning all the media outlets in the country. That, from one point of view, is a restriction on their free speech, but it increases the overall amount of free speech, that's, that's a very plausible claim. I'm going to say something similar here, although for different kinds of reasons. Regulating some speakers, and in particular restricting what some speakers can say, might improve the overall conceptual resources available to others, and therefore provide more free speech overall. So let me just wrap this up. What I've done is I've drawn on this Orwell passage and some other um, instances from the history of philosophy to point at this notion of a content constraint. A kind of situation a thinker can get themselves in that puts restrictions on what kinds of thoughts they can entertain. And I suggested that the possibility of content constraints matters for free speech. In particular, I suggested, again, building on this passage from Orwell, that free speech requires adequate conceptual and linguistic resources. And this motivates thinking about those factors and institutions that might improve or, uh, or worsen our conceptual resources. And it might also motivate regulating factors, including the speech of, for example, experts, that might diminish or threaten our conceptual resources. Right, well, thank you very much. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great talk. Okay, so now we'll go to Q&A. Please raise your hand if you have questions, and if you could remind us your name. Um, Um, so I, I'll, I'll give you my question first and then I'll explain my question. But my question is, do you think a linguistical history is necessary for freedom of speech or for some degree of freedom of speech? And now I ask this because Orwell was found it very important that language held a certain history and that when you were erasing certain concepts in language, you were erasing a certain history of that language and the history of that people. So in a pure new speak world, the idea is that there is actually no history which isn't dictated by the party. In which, in which case, if we would say you do need a linguistical history, we'd say, okay, they don't have any 
free speech. Um, but I wanted to introduce the idea, is that a necessary thing in order for free speech? And if, or is it to some degree of free speech? Because we may take a real world example of saying Nazi book permits, which we would probably say is fairly equivocal to some of the lesser things the party does in 1984. So would we say that Germans in World War II Germans had a lesser degree of free speech because a lot of their linguistical history would take their way? Um, yeah, well, that, that's a really interesting question. Um, so I, I think I don't want to answer it, if I if I may, but uh, but let me try and say a little bit about how to locate it with uh, with respect to the dialectic that I was setting up. So um, one interesting. So I said content constraints is an interesting and, and understudied phenomenon in philosophy of mind, philosophy of language. One thing that has been more studied is uh, what people sometimes call metasemantics. So semantics is the study of meaning. That's like, what do, what do your words mean? Or what are your, what, what's the content of your thoughts? And metasemantics is uh, studies um, how do your words come to have the meanings that they do? So in virtue of what is it the case that your words mean what you do, what, what they do? In virtue of what is it the case that your thoughts are about what they're about? Um, that's the kind of question that in the first instance uh, you might see someone like Putnam as answering. So Putnam says, like, in virtue, so we have this word, tree. What makes it the case that that's about trees? And he, he, he considers various possibilities, like is it that you entertain a certain mental image? No, it can't be that. It's got to be this kind of causal link. So that's a metasemantic theory. Uh, I've used that as an example. I haven't told you, you know, whether that's right. I haven't given you any real <coughs> serious argument for it or, or told you whether it's true or false. I think your historical view is similarly a kind of metasemantic view. It's saying, in virtue of what does the word tree mean what it does? Well, maybe it's also adopting a certain kind of picture of semantics, where semantics is a, is a richer thing than it's merely like about that kind of thing. It, it's going to incorporate, uh, you know, I, don't, I don't know, certain, certain beliefs or the, this, this kind of background baggage that goes along with it. Where does that all come from? Well, it comes from the history. And you erase the history, you erase that. That's erasing a big part of the meaning. So that's a metasemantic story. Now, in general, as I think the Putnam example shows, different metasemantic views are going to bring along with them different kinds of constraints. And correspondingly, that they're going to bring about different kinds of conclusions for what we should think is necessary for free speech. So if we think Putnam is right, then we might think getting causally in touch with different things is good for free speech. That's a kind of surprising surprising claim. Maybe we'll have to modulate that in terms of adequacy. Maybe, maybe getting in touch with different things doesn't really give us more adequate resources, even if it gives us more resources. But, um, likewise, I think on your history view, that kind of metasemantics will, uh, will make history relevant to free speech. Whether that's the right way to think about semantics and metasemantics, uh, I, I'm less sure, but I think that's where I would want to situate your question with respect to these kinds of issues. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, one question that I had is, so with Newspeak, it pres it, I find it interesting that it places constraints on sort of your ability to criticize and sort of what is it allowable to say you speak, and I was wondering, sort of, could you say that those constraints degrade over time? Presumably, like, say there's this bureaucratic process in the, in the government, you feel this sense of frustration with it. Now, there wouldn't be language to express that frustration in you speak, but surely, metaphysically, language indicates to something that we either perceive, we experience, whatever. So surely you can develop a way to express said frustration, and that overcomes the constraints it puts on the language. 
Yeah, I, I think that's a really good point. And in, in a way, it's very close to this issue about how strong of a constraint this is. Um, so, uh, so, uh, you know, uh, could, if we were in the new speak scenario, um, well, and I, we, we just get frustrated with something completely unrelated to government. We say, well, okay, let's call that feeling. <laughs> now, big brother is, <laughs> hey, I mean, surely that, that's like not so, so many steps to being able to express that, right? Um, Orwell actually has some things to say about something along these lines, but I, I think it's a, I have a hard time making sense of what he says, or at least of, of believing it. He says, like, well, technically you could say Big Brother is ungood. It's just kind of nobody would say that. It doesn't, oh, really? Um, so, uh, so uh, that's, that's my very articulate objection. <laughs> um, uh, so, yeah, it, I, I mean, I think this is a good point. And these things, maybe if we, um, so this is where the difference between different strengths of constraints is really going to play a role. And it's really going to matter, I think, for these issues about free speech, too, and whether we take this kind of worry about the experts seriously. So it might be like a Putnam kind of scenario where it's just like you, you get in a situation and you just can't get out of it. Like, you, you just can't say this thing. You, you just can't. Um, that looks like it, it potentially is like a real constraint that, and, and it, the way Orwell talks, it makes, makes it sound like Newspeak is supposed to be a kind of thing like that. But maybe that's really not very plausible. And if it is just a thing well, it, where it's like, yeah, well, you, you wouldn't say Big Brother is ungood, but you could, <laughs> is that really a constraint on your free speech? Well, that, that looks much less sort of threatening. Um, and, and likewise, with the kind of scenario that I was discussing with, with experts, maybe it's hard to go against the experts, but you know, maybe you can, and it's not, it's not like it's impossible. So how, how bad is that for free speech? Well, and I think those are really good questions, and, um, and I, I'm not, that's kind of the, the questions that I want to really work out to, to work out this research program. But, but yeah, I mean, I, I like the thought. And if you could remind us your name, please. <laughs> yeah, so my name is Isa. I was wondering if freedom of speech might not only be reliant on adequate um, conceptual resources, but also having the same conceptual resources as others. And the mm -hmm. way I want to kind of um, explain this is with the Orwell example of saying, okay, here you have this group of people that speak exclusively in new speak, and you have one person that speaks old speak, and maybe initially you would say that the person that speaks old speak has um, more freedom of speech than the new speak, but does it really matter because they won't understand his concepts anyways? Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's a great question, and it, it so, um, uh, one, um, one, uh, um, a, a point in the literature that uh, I'm drawing on here to some extent um, uh, in the literature on pornography. Um, so some people say um, uh, you can't regulate pornography because freedom of speech. Uh, but a point that's been made in this literature is that it might be that um, certain kinds of pornography's presence in the community makes it impossible for women or for some people to uh, express certain things, or at least for them to get uptake on certain, on, on, on certain things they might want to express. Um, uh, so if, if everyone comes to think no means yes, then uh, that's going to be a problem from the point of view of freedom of speech, at, at least on this line of thinking. So. Um, so I think what you're imagining is is something in in a way uh, in, in a way quite similar to that. Um, 
I think this is one place where uh, it might, where, where something I've been lumping together for the purposes of this talk might usually be drawn apart. Uh, so we might just, so I said adequate resources are conceptual and linguistic resources, but those might really come apart in an important way here. So the, the speaker of old speak might have adequate conceptual resources and might have in that sense the freedom of thought uh, without having freedom of speech, if we think freedom of speech it requires the possibility of uptake or something like that. Um, yeah, I think, in short, I think that's a good point. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so mine's uh, less complex, but it relates to your final conclusion around the idea of constraining experts or certain experts to promote freedom of speech. Um, and kind of one of the underlying assumptions there is that people take what experts say and kind of believe it a lot. Um, so say it's your uh, professor in university or someone on Twitter. Uh, not someone, but an expert. Um, or who's believed to be an expert. Uh, and my view would be that if you look at the way experts interact in the real world, especially uh, in the UK, kind of post-2016, the way we start to view experts, um, is that we really don't believe them. Lots of people in newspapers go around being like, oh, experts, idiots, um, etc. Uh, and obviously you could say, well, they possibly look to different experts. Um, but, but my point would be that actually there is a lot of doubt around experts. And actually the best way to promote freedom of speech, because one of your conclusions was you should restrain certain experts. Um, well, actually what you're better doing is kind of taking the mill argument, um, saying you have this free trade, because people are quite open to looking at experts and being like, oh, I disagree with you. Uh, so for example, lots of newspapers took views against experts on COVID. Um, some took pros, some took against. Uh, it wasn't all kind of one line. And so that possibly rather than trying to constrain certain experts, the best way to promote freedom of speech, because there is this marketplace of ideas, not just within normal people, but within experts as well, is to not constrain them. Uh, what's your kind of thoughts on that? Yeah, great. I, I think this is a, a really good question that raises a lot of issues that I glossed over in the interest of time and during the talk. So let me try to unpack this just a little bit. We won't be able to resolve all of this here, but I, but I think this is, a, this is a great question. So, um, so the first thing is, um, the way most people are thinking about the role of experts here is, it's not just that everyone has to believe them. And, and maybe everyone believing them isn't even all that important. So think about Putnam on beaches and elms again. Um, Putnam is very open to the idea that uh, we might discover very surprising things about, um, about uh, how the world is. So we might discover that Elms aren't actually trees, they're actually robots from Mars, or something like that. that. That's the kind of thing. Putnam is very open to the idea that that's a theory you might have, you can believe that, you might have evidence for it. It might even turn out to be true. We can't rule it out a priori. So, uh, consider Putnam and suppose that he thinks elms aren't trees, they're robots from Mars. What is he talking about? So he doesn't believe the experts. The experts think elms are trees. But what is he talking about when he says elms aren't trees? Well, he's talking about elms. So the experts are still governing what his word means, even though he's not believing their view about what those things he's talking about in virtue of what they're doing are. Okay, so, so that's one, so I think the issue about believing the experts versus the, the, the meta-semantic role, that the, the meaning-determining role of experts is a bit complex here, and, um, well, we, we, we could talk more, we could talk at length about exactly how that works, but um, we, we can't right now. Um, so that's one kind of point. The second kind of point is, what does it take for experts to be able to do this meaning determining, content determining work? 
Um, one view is, well, people often have this kind of picture where there are the experts and they're a kind of univocal block. They all think the same thing. And then there's us ignorant folk who are just parasitic on the experts. But of course, that's totally unrealistic. The experts are very often going to disagree amongst themselves. But what happens then? Suppose some of the experts say elms aren't trees, and others say, no, they are trees. What, what happens then? What does elm mean? Well, I, again, I think this is a good question and something that we, we probably have to think hard to really get to the bottom of. One possibility would be sort of like majority rules, like whatever most experts think goes. Another possibility would be um, there are now two groups of experts, and depending on which one you follow, you'll mean something different. So if I'm with the tree ones, then I mean you know, elm by elm. If, if I'm with the robot ones, then I mean robot from Mars by elm, or something like that. Another possibility would be, at this point, elm starts to lose its meaning altogether. Now, nobody is making it the case there's no group that's there to sort of hold this word in place and make it mean, well, anything, because they're pulling it in different, different directions, sort of ripping it apart, as it were. In that latter kind of possibility, then this kind of dispute among experts uh, could potentially create a, you know, an even worse situation as regards free speech than, than I was suggesting. It could make our words meaningless. Whether that's plausible, I, so I'm not, not purporting to have defended that view or, or any, I, I don't think I'd want to defend that view, but, but I think there are a lot of issues here. Um, one, uh, one final issue that is raised by your question, I think, is who's going to count as an expert in the sense that's relevant to meaning determination or content constraint? Um, I think when people say, since 2016, we're skeptical of experts or, or things like that, they mean like academic experts or people with advanced degrees and scientific credentials and stuff like that. Um, that's one notion of expert, but another notion is just people who are believed, people who have, enjoy a certain kind of power or status. It might be that what you have to do to be in a position to uh, fix what we all mean, to determine what our words mean or what our thoughts are about, is not get an academic degree or anything, or you know, even actually know stuff. It's just to get people to listen to you. And in that case, I, I, I don't think we've really, I mean, it's not clear what like undermining the status of experts or like we don't believe the experts, what that would even mean or what that could mean. So, this word expert here is um, papering over a big mess of issues that I think your question uncovers really well. Um, and what exactly we, we want to say about all those issues is, you know, well, the, they're issues, right? So, so um, yeah, so I, I guess that's not really a, a great answer, but there are some of the, the questions that I think are packed into your question. That's all the time we have, but we will be going to the pub afterwards if you have any unanswered questions. Dr. Ball will be joining us, so thank you again. <laughs>